The topic that I'm going to speak on is rhythm of revival. Can someone shout at me? Rhythm of revival. And I'm going to kind of go along with what Pastor Vlad preached about two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago about going deeper with the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys remember that message? Phenomenal message. Talked about the river, how revival is not like a tsunami. It's like a river. A revival is not a reservoir. Reservoir, water comes in and stays in. A swamp, water comes in and it stays in. It gets nasty, it gets dirty. But a river, water comes in and water goes out. And it stays healthy. And not only it stays healthy, it blesses everything that it comes in contact with. When revival hits the church, Reformation has to come into our city. Reformation has to come into our society. Our schools have to look different. Our marriages got to look different. Our businesses got to look different. Drugs has to be wiped from our city. Not just building bigger prisons, but building bigger churches. That's what happens when revival hits our church. Amen? And I'm going to go off of that today. Revival, rhythm of revival. I'm going to speak from Acts 3 chapter 1. In Acts 3, 3 chapter 1, you guys can follow along. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. So he went to the Monday through Friday morning prayer at Hungry Gen. And as they approached the temple, a, a man lame from birth was carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. So he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at him eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus, of, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up. And walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And then, and as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Come on, somebody, can I get an amen? He jumped up, stood on his feet, he began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, praising God, he went into the temple with all of them. Verse 9 All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they, they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out of the amazement to Solomon and they gave praise. Today, rhythm of revival. I believe God wants to do something in our church. I believe this next year for our church, God is going to pour out revival. But I believe... A sh revival comes when there is a shift. Revival comes when there is a breaking. And I believe next year more than revival is going to be out there. I believe revival is going to start in here. I believe God is going to shift something in the side, in the, in the heart of every single believer that will cause us to begin to spread the gospel that will cause us to begin to preach the gospel the good news to people and the first point I want to bring to every single person here and you guys can write it down or follow us on our notes is stop by the people others pass by I want you to see this the lame man when Peter and John they were going you look in the Bible Peter and John were not going to this lame man to pray for him Peter and John were on his, their way to pray at the temple. The lame man was not in the plans of Peter and John that day. But how, do you, how many of you guys know they were on God's heart? Peter and John, they would, did not wake up in the morning and think about, I'm going to go to this lame man on the side of the, beside the temple gate called Beautiful, and I'm going to evangelize to this man. No, no, no. They were headed on their way to pray. And as they were on their way to pray, they were sensitive enough, they were aware enough to spread the gospel to a lame man. I want to bring a point to you guys today. You don't have to go out to evangelize. You simply just evangelize as you go. 
You don't have to ev go out to evangelize. You simply make up in your life. My life is not what I want to do. And then somewhere on the list, if, if something presents itself, if, if, if we really do evangelism and church does it, and then I will evangelize. No, no, no. The gospel, the, the great commission in Matthew 28, that go therefore out to all the nations and make disciples and save the lost, baptize him. I build my life on what God wants me to do. Not my purpose, but the purpose God has for me. And you will find that as you go, as you live your life, evangelism happens when God and I want you to see this when Peter and John prayed for the man this is what happens his feet and his ankles instantly got strengthened and they got healed when you allow God's heart to intervene into your plans God will begin to use your hands God will begin to use you to do miracles, signs, and wonders. When you get so close to God and you say, God, I might not be an evangelist. God, I might not be a pastor. God, I might not be a preacher. But God, what I am is available. I might not have the ability to preach. I might not have the ability to, to preach like Pastor Vlad or this person or evangelist. But what I do have is I have your word in my heart. And what I do have is a voice. What I do have is a business. And so when you allow God's heart to intervene into every plan that you have, you watch your business will no longer be selling product, just selling products. Your business will be saving people. When you allow God's heart, when you allow God's, what God's heart breaks for, what Jesus died for, to be what you live for, you will see evangelism won't be a department in our church. We might have it. We might have people. We might hire people. But the job of seeing revival in our city, of seeing reformation in our society, is not the job of the pastor, but the everyday churchgoer. Can I get an amen? amen. Your greatest ability is your availability. You might not have what it takes. You might be like, well... Zach, I don't got a mic like you. Zach, I don't have a voice like this, a preaching gift. Are you available? And God is going to begin to use that. You just begin to step out. See, faith is not knowing exactly what's going to happen. Faith is stepping out so God can step in. Step out on that way to work. Step out on the way that you're in your school and you will begin to see revival in our city. I believe there's a rhythm to revival. I believe revival, just like Pastor Vlad preached, it's not a raging tsunami, it's a river. Raging tsunami, it's going to wipe everything out. Yes, we are believing for revival. Yes, we're believing for an outpour of the Holy Spirit. We're believing like the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people get added to the church. We're believing for all of that. But there's also the base, there's the foundation. There's like the, God's heartbeat. When you think about a heartbeat, it's consistent. A heartbeat is constant. This is how revival is in our city. It's constant. It's not a, a revival doesn't come when a pastor preaches a sermon. Revival comes when every church goer stops by the person. Everybody passes by. Think about this. This lame man was begging since birth. Since birth. So it has to be many, many years that this lame man was begging. And it was only Peter and John that stopped by to offer him a miracle. To offer him Jesus. How long has this man been waiting for a miracle? Can we be sensitive enough, close enough to God's heart to hear what his heart beats for? And that is souls. That is the lost. Revival. There is a rhythm to it. I don't believe revival is just a season. I don't believe it's just a section of your life. Revival is an everyday surrender in serving Jesus. Serving God. It's being on fire for God every single day. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be the pastor. You don't have to be the evangelist to go out and be the difference in your society. It doesn't have to be big to be impactful. It doesn't have to be thousands. It can be one or two. 
Come on somebody, you don't have to be able, you don't have to preach to a, a congregation of 10,000. But you can lead a life group of 10 people. It's stopping by the person everybody passes by. It's saying, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, I don't want to be the Christian that passes by the person you're calling me to stop by. I don't want to be the believer that it's life is simply about me, myself, and I, my marriage, my family, my kids. But God, let my life look like your life. You lived a life of selflessness. We didn't just say, God, we love you. But love always is backed by action. For God so loved the world, He gave. There was an action that was backed by the love. There was an action that was backed by the, by the, the, the word that I love you. If we love God, we serve His people. I love what Pastor Vlad said. He shared this quote uh, two weeks ago. A pastor who wins 10,000 people monthly will win the world in 60 years. I mean, you know, I know Jesus is coming soon, but most likely he's coming before 60,000 years. A person who wins two people every month and teaches them to do the same will win the world in 30 months. Someone say, I have a job to do. Someone say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Someone say, rhythm of revival. I love what Craig Rochelle, he posted this morning, I was going through, um, and Craig Rochelle says, you don't have to be in full-time ministry to be, to minister full-time. Being a light to those in your office, to choosing to do the right thing even when it's hard, getting lunch with a hurting co-worker, praying with a friend who needs the hope of Jesus, leading a life group with your friends. Whether you're a doctor, a teacher, a student, a receptionist, a lawyer, a stay-at-home parent, working three jobs or working one job, you are called to ministry. You are called to ministry. I believe we are in the hour. I believe we're in the time where God wants to use the nobodies to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody. And his name is Jesus. I believe we're in the time where God wants to raise up the nobodies of society. The nobodies that I just sit in a pew. I don't really have a spot. I don't really have a position. I don't really got, I don't really have this. I don't really have that. He wants to raise them up to tell everybody about Jesus that can save anybody. Someone shout, that's me. That's me. That's me. It's the taking the time out of your day. And you know, I'm serving God. God saved me from sin. And so because God saved me from sin, I'm going to go to the temple gate called beautiful and I'm going to pray to God. That's good. But there's a flip side to salvation. Salvation wasn't just God saving you from something. It was God saving you for something. God didn't just save you from sin. He saved you for a purpose. And that purpose is the cause of Christ. That purpose is not maybe being in full-time ministry as in being a pastor or evangelist. That's being full-time minister in your business. Full-time minister in your school. Full-time minister as a janitor. As a single mom. As a single dad. Saying, God, anywhere I go, let my heart break for what your heart breaks for. God, I don't want to be the Christian that passes is by the person you died for. I don't want to be that person. We want to, we want to see a rhythm in revival. We want to see consistency. We don't want to see three months of everybody in church and the next three years you never step into a church again. We want to see that a river, it flows, it's constant, and it brings life. That when revival is in your heart, you take it everywhere you go. Revival is not going to be when everybody comes to church. It's going to be when the church goes to everybody. It's going to be when we, no, we take that, you know, salvation, God, you saved me from my sin. Thank you. But you also saved me for a purpose. 
and I know I might not be this person. God, I know I might not have this influence, but if, if I know a person or two, I have influence in my life. There's something inside of me that God, that I'm caring, that God wants me to release to my neighbors. There's something about that. We don't want to be a church that burns bright and then burns out. We want to be a church that burns for long. Revival has to be integrated into our routine. We don't, yes, there's going to be times where, hey, today as a church, we're going out and to evangelize. Hey, we're doing a park service. Hey, we're doing this. We're doing that. An unashamed club. Yes, that's great. But that, that might be a platform for us to use. But our purpose is to spread the gospel in every area of our lives. This is actually why, you know, as we're leading unashamed clubs, as of right now, we have about, we are in as a church, as a youth ministry, we're in about six different high schools spreading the gospel every single Tuesday. Come on, can we put our hands together for Jesus? And we're seeing so much change happening, happening in students' lives. But what I tell our students, our student leaders, when we have leaders meeting, and anytime, anytime I, t I see them, I tell them, hey guys, I know we have unashamed clubs happening on a Tuesday lunchtime. I said, but do not limit unashamed clubs to a Tuesday at lunchtime. Unashamed clubs is not just a program. It's a people. It's a purpose. It's who we are to share the gospel. It's what we're called to. So don't, yes, we have it on a Tuesday lunch, but take it to your football locker room. Take it to your volleyball practice. Take it to your family. We are called to be unashamed of the gospel. We are called to be carriers of God's presence. We are called to be the people that say, I'm not going to limit my Christianity to a two-hour service on a Sunday morning my, my, my Christian life is a walk with God I'm not gonna have to go out to evangelize I evangelize as I go to the marketplace I evangelize as I'm working in a janitor job or a tech job anywhere I go I'm an evangelist anywhere I go I'm a preacher of the gospel come on can we put our hands together for Jesus it doesn't just belong in a club it belongs in the coffee shop. What's in the church belongs in the streets. It belongs in every area and aspect of our society. And when we don't rely on a pastor to bring down the revival and we take on that call we take on that burden to see souls saved you might not save 10,000 but you can see 10, 10 people uh, discipled saved and sent in your life group in your connect group there is an impact that you can make whether big or small God didn't call us to be successful in the eyes of man he called us to be faithful what, what world did God put you in? Is it in the world of, of social media? Is it in the world of the friends and the area that you're around? May 2024 be the year that God breaks your heart. Not that you get your heart broken by people, but your heart is broken for people. See, there's a pain that comes when people break your heart. I believe as we say, God, break my heart for people, there's going to be a whole lot less heartbreak. Can I get an amen? amen? Someone, that's a word for 2024. Come on. We're going to see revival. Someone say revival. God is going to pour out His Spirit. I believe there's something huge coming. I believe our church is on the brink of seeing thousands flood our church. But we're not going to just sit here, cross our arms and say, God, when it happens, it happens. What we're going to do is we're going to position ourselves. We're going to align ourselves that when it does come, we catch the outpouring. That when it does come, our cup is aligned with the outpouring so that we can see it. Our systems are ready to see thousands. Our structure is ready to see thousands. We have enough life groups to fit the people that God wants to send to us. You know, I tell our students, our youth group, I said, guys, God, he's not running, he's not looking on his shelf of revival and he's like, oh, we're running short. Uh, we're out of stock. 
of revival. I mean, guys, keep on praying. Maybe it's on back order. You know what I mean? It's back order. It'll be here in a few weeks, maybe a few years. Uh, but just keep on praying. And when it does come, I'm going to give it to you. No, no, no. God is not running on shortage of revival to give to our city. I believe God says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors, the workers are few. So instead of saying, God, pour out your revival, say, God, ready me for revival. God, make me a person that can carry your gospel, God. Make me a person that's unashamed of the gospel. That when the revival comes, when your spirit comes, when the opportunity comes to share the gospel, I don't run away from it, but I dive into the opportunity. I don't say well the pastor is going to do it no 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 I'm the preacher to this person I'm the evangelist to my friends to my family in Jesus name you know as I was reading this passage I saw three different types of people that came in contact with this man the first person that came in contact with this man was the people to, uh, that offered to move him to the gate the second person was the people that offered him money at the gate. And the third person, third people, were the people that offered him a miracle to get inside the gate. I believe inside the gate, you know, as God was bringing me this word, really fun, inside that gate, inside the temple, it's like, it's like heaven. It's making, it's eternity with Christ. If you picture with me. And, and I really felt like God was saying, hey, there is good people in this world. People that are going to offer to move them close, help them out in life. There's going to be the people that are going to offer them money, material things. And all of that is good. We have this. We have other things to offer people. But I really felt, really, as I was studying the scripture, it's us as believers. We have the only thing, the only thing we have to offer that other people can't. is not money. It's not material things. But it's a miracle. That, not get, that doesn't get them to the gate, by the gate, near the gate, just close enough to heaven. But what we have to offer might not be money, but it's a miracle. What we might not have to offer is a, a house, a car, a job, but we do have to offer Jesus. That cannot get them by the gate, but can heal their legs. That can heal them from their sin issue. That can transform their life and get them into heaven. Can I get an amen? Only us as believers have something to offer to get the brokenhearted, the lost, the addicted to heaven. And his name is Jesus. No, it's good to give the money. It's good to give all that kind of stuff. But what we, why we have the responsibility as Christians to share our faith, church, is because the world has its programs to help people. But we don't have a program. We have a person that from heaven came down to earth, put on skin, walked this dirty earth and died on the cross and rose three days later. We have him to offer to those to say, hey, you don't have to stand by the gate. Hey, you don't have to stay addicted. You don't have to stay lost. You don't have to go from divorce to divorce. Hey, you don't have to live, work three jobs and constantly be in lack. Hey, you don't have to struggle in your family. The devil doesn't have to torment your family forever. What I don't have is money, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I might not have money material things but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus rise up from your addiction rise up from your pain rise up from depression rise up from torment rise up from addiction rise up from divorce get up and walk get up and walk the gate is open for you come on somebody Give God 10 seconds of praise if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. Come on, someone say, I'm only ashamed of the gospel. Come on, somebody. Yes, Jesus. What you are asking for, I do not have. But what I do have, I offer you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What we have is more important than the world can give. You know, as I was going on into this passage, it kind of made me laugh. 
uh, as this man got healed, the lame man, and he walked into the temple gate dancing, praising, shouting. <laughs> I want you to see what, what everybody said. All the people saw him walking and saw him, heard him praising. When they realized he was the lame beggar, they had seen so often. So this, these people in the gate, they saw this man. They weren't blind. Okay? Don't say you don't have an opportunity to evangelize. He was, people are there. It's just, are you looking? These people, it says, they saw the man coming in that they passed by at work every single day. This man that was coming in, they saw this woman that they passed by the park when you were walking your kid and she was walking her kid. You saw her every single day walking in. They were surprised. Wow, you made it. Wow, you made it into heaven. I don't want to be the Christian that makes it to heaven and then watches a person I pass by every single day walk in and say, oh wow, you made it. <laughs> well, can I give a word for somebody? It's usually the person you're passing by, the person you're not talking to. It's the person that when you get to heaven and they get to heaven, you're going to look at them and say, wow, you actually made it here. Yeah, we all got that people in the back of our head. You're like, yeah, this person is definitely not make it. Unless Jesus himself comes, which he did. And so God helped their souls. It's the person that if you were to go to heaven and when you go to heaven, not if, come on somebody. When and they go to heaven, you, don't, you look at them and you're like, wow, I'm surprised you made it here. It's you, probably that person God is calling you to stop and talk to them. Amen. Some of you guys got that person. You got to go back to work and talk to that person. Sometimes the greatest miracles will come from the greatest inconvenience. I know it's inconvenient to you to do this. I know it's inconvenient to you to stop. And um, I was just right now, before worship, I was in, a, in the bathroom washing my hands. The other guy's washing his hands. And I was like, about to leave. And I was, I was never seen this guy before. And right there, in the, uh, you know, we shook hands and then we washed our hands. And then... Some of you, I'm going to be praying for some people that are like, <laughs> miss me with that. Come on, somebody. And within me, I felt God right there. You were about to not do what you're about to preach. <laughs> and I was like, all right, God. Sounds good. Hey, bro, I know you're about to wash your hands. Do you have a number? Have you been here before? Have you been to our youth? No, God, it's number. And I realized... Now, it's so easy to talk about it. It's another thing to live it. But when we can make a decision today, as in, in every, change, every church goer, your average Joe, whether you're a single parent, you, you have all parents, whether you're a high school student, middle school, whether you're a college student, you're elderly in your age, you're seasoned in your age, wherever you are in your life, whatever aspect or a part of society that you're in, if we can say going into 2024, God, more than I'm going to pray for revival out there, God, start something in here, the fire in my bones that I cannot contain, that I cannot control, something within me that wants to preach the gospel to people around me. You know, when I was starting unashamed clubs in our youth last year we started our first club in March 30th we've seen hundreds of students come to know Jesus hundreds this past year we've seen over 300 students high schoolers say yes to Jesus in their high school God is good and when the, one of the biggest thoughts that came to my mind why I started the unashamed clubs because I began to think first of all we had nobody in our youth, so I was like, I need to find some way, okay? I should be real transparent with you guys. And I began to think, expecting a non-believer that has never been invited, has never seen a post on Instagram, to randomly walk into church is equivalent to a criminal walking into the police station. It's just not going to happen. And if it is, he's basically saved already. He's that good if he walks into church. This is why the, this is why the police men, the cops, 
What do they have to do to get a criminal? They have to catch them. What did Jesus say if you follow him? If you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. What do you do with fish? You catch fish. You have to go to where they are. You have to go to where the loss is. Expecting them to come in is like expecting a robber to turn himself in. And so that's why we started on the shame clubs. I was like, okay, students, yeah, they might trickle in here and there, but we have to go to where they're at. We have to catch them. We have to see a miracle catch in our church. 2024 has to be a miracle catch of salvation. 2024 has to be a miracle catch for your family. You're not just writing down names. You're putting them into the heavenly realm. And you're saying, God, I'm going to pray until we see them saved. God, I'm going to see my friend that is an alcohol. I'm going to see my brother that is lost. I'm going to see my son and daughter that is in sin. God in the heavenly realms in prayer. God in fasting. We're going to catch their lost soul. We're going to see them saved. We don't just pray for jokes. We don't just pray every single morning, Monday through Friday. You will see every minute, every hour, people on their knees praying over the lost names. Why? Because it's not just a phrase that we, that we say. Yes, we might not be able to do this, but what we do have, in the name of Jesus, we're going to pray them out of their pit of hell. In the name of Jesus, we're going to pray them out of their drugs. We're going to pray them out of their sin. We're going to pray them out of their lost life. Can I get an amen? We're going to catch them. Follow me. Following Jesus must lead to fishing. You know, I remember the story of Aiden. We mentioned, we mentioned last time I preached on a youth conference, we mentioned Aiden, a student. He was in Chihuahua High School, had a very rough up, up, upbringing, a very rough life. And as he was living his life, he was in school, about to get kicked out of school. One morning, Tuesday morning, he was walking for lunch. He was walking past the portables, and we had our unashamed clubs in that portable. He was actually walking past the portable to go up the hill, and that's where he smoked every day for lunch. Uh, interesting lunch. And so, as he was walking on his way up the hill to smoke, somebody stopped Somebody stepped into their inconvenience, stepped into the moment where they could have just went straight to the class. Hey, they're living a Christian life. They were saved from something, so they're going to go serve God. They stepped into that and saw an opportunity. Hey, what are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm going up the hill just to chill. And they invited him to Unashamed Club. Ever since that day, he came a couple times. Didn't know what he was doing. He was high as a kite. But months later, now he is going to unashamed clubs. Not to receive, but to preach the gospel to other students. If I can get the screenshots. Do you have any screenshots? Of some students. <clears throat> We've seen one student, one girl. Came from unashamed clubs. And... Ever since then, she came from Unashamed Club. She grew up with drugs, alcohol, molestation, all that kind of stuff. God radically encountered her at Unashamed Clubs. And right now, she's serving God to the fullest. There's another girl. She grew up, got taken advantage of, struggled with drugs because of her self-worth. It was just shattered. Her identity shattered. And so she ran to guys. She ran to, girl, to, uh, to drugs, to other types of stuff randomly walking through the hall and somebody one of our leaders one of our students stepped out said you know I, i'm comfortable I just, whoever comes to the uh, to the club comes to the club but they stepped down and said hey do you want to come to the club didn't know what it is came to the club till this day she is serving christ here we have one student said one of our leaders said some kid who got saved at clubs walked up to me tonight and said he hasn't smoked in four weeks this is what it's about. Stop by where people, the people 
that most people pass by. Be the person that takes somebody to lunch that is hurting, that stops for a split second and asks somebody, how are you doing? And we're going to begin to see, just like we're doing, not waiting for kids come to church, but we're going to their schools, to where they are, meeting them where they're at. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He didn't wait for us to become good. He came down being good, died for us, met us where we're at, and from there, we rose. When we go to them, we're going to begin to catch souls. We're going to see a miracle catch. Another person said, I just wanted to message you and say thank you for the message. I invited my friend who haven't been to church for over a year. She has been battling depression, suicide problems at home and so much. And while you were preaching, she just started crying. And when I took her to the front, she was delivered and now she's free. And I've never seen her so happy or excited about God like this. And she told me she's seen a big light and couldn't even open her eyes while she's getting prayed for. Thank you. This is a person that on the outside looked great, but on the inside was broken. And it took somebody to tell everybody about Jesus. And guess what? She got saved, set free, and delivered. This is what it's about. You don't have to be on a high pulpit to be able to be influential. You don't have to preach to 10,000. You can lead a life group of 10 people. And you can see slowly but surely if every person here doesn't just walk into the gate called beautiful. You don't just walk into the gate with you and your bestie. But you walk into church. You walk into the gate with a lame man. With a broken man. God, I don't want to come to the church and just pray. I want to come to church with the lost. God, I want to come to church with the brokenhearted. God, I don't want my hands to be empty when I go to heaven. When I go to heaven, I don't want to look back and say, I passed so many by. I want to look to go to heaven and say, look God, who is with me? The people everybody passed, I stopped at. Everybody didn't talk to, I talked to. Come on, somebody. Come on. 45% of unchurched U.S. teenagers said they would be interested in attending church if somebody invited them. That means people want it. You just, we, the workers are few. The laborers. We are the laborers. We are the workers. We are the people that might not offer them material, but not, might not offer them money but we can offer them a miracle and that miracle is a gift the gift of salvation that Jesus died for for you and for me in Jesus name number two point I'm going to be bringing this to an end is hear the cry behind the question hear the cry behind the question I want you to pay attention to this lame man I want to ask you a question. If you were lame, if you could not walk, what would you want in that moment? If you could get anything you wanted. I don't think you would want the money. I would think you would want the miracle. When we as Christians, and I'm talking about the case of eternity. When it comes to some people are struggling, sometimes the best thing you could do is give them money. Something the best thing you could do is buy them a pair of shoes. That's charity, all that good uh, being just, it's not even a Christian, it's a godly principle. You just, good person, you give money, your clothes, your, your, all this kind of stuff. You, you give them, buy them a meal. It's great. But when I'm talking about the case of eternity, money can't do anything. They need a miracle. Why wasn't this lame man asking for a miracle not only he wasn't asking for a miracle they said that when he was asking them for money Peter and John looked with him, at him intently and Peter said to him look at us this man that means this man has settled for money for so long he's not even expecting a miracle some people you might be in that lie well hey people they, they don't want church they don't want God Look, he's asking for money. I mean, look at this person. He's drinking every day. When I, you know, he doesn't want church. She doesn't want to go to a life group. Look, look, they want to party. They just want to live a gambling life. Look, that's all they talk about. Yes, that's all they talk about. 
But maybe, just maybe, and it's just a big maybe, what if the reason they're asking for money is because so many people, good and bad, have passed them by for so long that he no longer has the faith to believe for a miracle. This is where we as believers have to step in and say, I know what you're wanting. I know what you're wanting, but I know what you need. You're wanting a miracle but you, because you've settled in your situation for so long. You're okay with the divorce. You're okay with the joblessness. You're okay with the broken family. And what you want is just a band-aid on top. Because if I give you money, guess what? You stay where you're at. But if I can give you a miracle, if I can offer you Jesus, you can get up from where you're at. Which is the, if you're lame, whether you're Christian or not, you want to walk. When you're lost, whether you know it or not, you want to be saved. You want to be found and we as Christians got to be spiritually mature to look at the person and see past their ask and see their cry. I know what you're asking but if I would split you down the middle what your heart wants and craves is for fulfillment is Jesus. I know you're asking me this but what you really want is Jesus. 35% of U.S. teenagers have reported having suicidal thoughts in the last three months. I know our generation, it looks like all they want is bad drugs, alcohol, this, sex, all of that. But us as believers, we know if we offer them that, if the world is offering that, they stay lame. They stay lost. They stay broken. They stay addicted. But we have to know the same God that delivered me can be the same God that can deliver you. The same God that saved my brother from eight years of drug addiction can be the same God that can save your brother, that can save your son, that can save your daughter, that can mend the marriage, that can mend the finances, that can bring the, uh, the family back together. I know what you're asking, but I know what you're needing. And what you need is not that girl. What you need is unconditional love, and that comes from the Father. I know what you're doing is filling yourself with alcohol, but what you really want is fulfillment that only comes from God. It only comes from God. And that is what I have. That is what I have. And you know, when they're asking not for Jesus, when they're asking for the world, for material things, it's very intimidating in that moment to say, hey, what about Jesus? And so you get that lie, the biggest lie that I, I believed. What if they don't want it? And I'm going to give you just really, really just profound. The best advice you'll hear in 2023. But what if they do? What if they don't? Well, I mean, it might hurt your ego. It might hurt your pride. But what if they did? We lost eternity, a soul with eternity with Christ. That was the biggest thing that broke it for me. If they don't, cool. Shake off my... If you want to stay lame by the side of the gate, that's up to you. I'm going to the gate. But I'm offering a hand. I know you're, you don't see that you're broken. I do. Some people don't know what it is to live a mended marriage, a good family, but you do. Or maybe you've never lived it, but you know from the Bible standpoint what God promises. And from that say, hey, you don't have to live in your dirt. You don't have to live in the pig's pen, uh, a prodigal son. You don't have to. Over here is much better. And you offer that hand. You offer that help to the people. It might feel like they don't want and if they don't it is what it is but if they do that's a life transformed that's another person added into the church that's another person that's saying God I'm going to serve you with all that I have and I bring this to an end God's heart is people God's method is your life God's heart what heart what his heart breaks for it's for you and for, I, for, for you and for me. It breaks for the lost. 
God's strategy, His method, is your business, is your career, is your school, is your life group, is your voice, it's your impact, it's your influence, it's the reach that you have, the people that you know, the companies you're connected with, the businesses that you've came across, it's this person, the long lost cousin, it's your life that God wants to use. It says found people, find people. We are people that God's not just going to save from sin, but He's going to save us for a purpose and that purpose is a great commission to go out into the, all the world baptizing people discipling them and saving them in Jesus name we pray